Humans have used me as shelter for thousands of years, living together in peace and harmony. But 1500 years ago, everything changed. Let me tell you a tragic tale. There once was a prince called Kashyapa, who was so greedy for power that he killed his own father, the king. He buried him alive and came to me with his army, trying to escape from this revengeful brother. Kashyapa was scared for his life and thought I would keep him safe. And I did, for a while. Now 1500 years has passed and the king's army is long gone. But another army is still here, still ready to attack anything they see as a threat to their queen and me. The rock known as Sigiriya or Lion Rock is in Sri Lanka, a teardrop-shaped island at the southeast tip of India, famous for its Ceylon tea. Hidden from the outside world for 500 years, Sigiriya is found about 160 kilometers away from Sri Lanka's capital, Colombo. Monsoonal rains fall twice a year determining the seasons and the migration of these bees. I am strong and patient and I endure, while around me the world keeps changing. I have provided a haven for many. Before the king, my caves were monasteries where Buddhist priests found solace and shelter and peace. But Kashipa the king put an end to all that. He had these frescoes drawn on me. Now so ancient, they are a part of me. When I look at them, I remember him. For 18 years, the king and his builders were busy. I used to be a simple rock, standing here alone. But he was a man of earthly pleasures and built gardens and fountains, palaces and pools all around me. And no king comes alone. There were soldiers and servants and hundreds of concubines who saw to his every need. I miss the peace but it was an interesting time. That was 15 centuries ago. Of course, the king and his soldiers are dead, but an army still lives in the rock fortress. Thousands of warriors who stand to attention, protecting the rock from harm. Simple farmers, really, until they're under threat. Then all hell breaks loose. They attack en masse with deadly accuracy, injuring and maiming everything in their path. They are giant stinging honeybees known to scientists as Apis dorsata, the most aggressive and deadly type of bee found in South Asia. The bees are twice the size of European honeybees and their stinger is three times as long. But Sigiriya has become a UNESCO World Heritage Site one of the great archaeological wonders of the world. It's visited by hundreds of thousands of people every year who climb the time-worn steps that lead to the summit of this rock, passing just meters away from this army of venomous warriors. These giant stinging honeybees have been known to attack anything that's perceived as dangerous to their queen. They act as one battalion, a superorganism always in the best interests of the whole colony. On May the 1st, 2004, 
A child threw a stone at one of the nests and the bees went on a rampage. The bees first attack your head and especially the face and then they attack the whole body. A few even managed to get into my ears. The pain was excruciating and I didn't know what to do. When they sting, they leave their sting on the skin and the pain is just unbearable. I had hundreds of these white stings all over my body. Lasting many hours, injuring over 200 terrified tourists, some seriously. Over 100 people were admitted to hospital. About 20 of those were women, and more than 55 were school children on a day out. The attack in 2004 was not the first, and will not be the last. My army is always poised to defend me. They brought me peace again, but this calm never lasts for long. When will they attack again? I am Sigaria, the Lion Rock. In the 5th century, I was home to Sri Lankan King Kashyapa, his queens and his concubines. I was his hideaway and his pleasure palace. The king, he died long ago, but his army is still here. Every year, when the trees blossom, they come to me, seeking food, seeking shelter. They protect me from harm. Sri Lanka is a country hit by the southwest and the northeast monsoon. Some areas receive more than 500 centimeters of rain a year, others considerably less. The rainfall patterns that sweep across Sri Lanka also dictate the migratory patterns of the stinging honeybees. They fly away from the rain and towards new sources of nectar, pollinating the flowers as they go on their journey. These giant honeybees are found all over South Asia. Bee and man have lived side by side for generations in the small rural towns of Sri Lanka in perfect harmony. Dr. Punchi Heva has studied these insects for many years and has grown to appreciate their value to the country at large. He's been an entomologist for 30 years. He's passionate about insects, but most especially about the bees. I think every child has a kind of an insect period in their life. And perhaps mine, um, I kept it all these years. Dr. Punchi Heva splits his time between teaching at a local university and traveling around Sri Lanka studying the bees. His current project is to document their migratory patterns throughout the country. Having worked with bees for three decades, Dr. Punchi Heva knows when the bees can be approached and when he needs to keep his distance. This type of honeybee is open nesting where the bees hang on the outside of their nest and are more vulnerable to attack than most other bees, making them more aggressive. For Dr. Punchi Heva, Sigiriya and the bees are inextricably linked. Bees should have been coming to Sigiriya for thousands of years. And one essential character of Sigiriya for me, from human point, the frescoes, and from natural, nature's point, the bees. So without uh, the bees and the frescoes, Sigiriya will lose its character. For Dr. Punchi Heva, the bees are as integral a part of Sigiriya as the frescoes themselves. These paintings are believed to be fragments of an immense backdrop that stretched across the face of the rock. Over 500 paintings may have graced these walls, drawn 1,000 years before Michelangelo painted frescoes at the Sistine Chapel. They're still hauntingly beautiful, providing a doorway into the past. Now, so few of these paintings remain. Long ago, they stretched across me. I was a mighty canvas for the king's artists. But who are these women? Concubines? Celestial nymphs? It's hard to say. 
but I know the king loved them. King Kashipa lived well, but in fear. He feared death at the hands of his brother. He hired master builders to create his pleasure palace. This was my golden age. 15 centuries ago, I was a grand citadel, totally symmetrical by design. I, Lion Rock, was at its very center. There were pleasure gardens and bathing pools, fountains and pagodas. Thousands of people lived here, soldiers, servants and concubines, all serving the king. Halfway up the limestone steps, he built this mighty lion. Entering through its open mouth, the king would make his final climb to his private pleasure palace. Even the boulders were landscaped, all part of a geometrical plan. Now, one of the oldest gardens in the world. The king's soldiers died long ago, but an army still lives here with me, protecting many things, their queen and their precious golden treasure, the honey. The giant stinging honeybees build their nests on sparsely leaved trees or rock crevices where they can see the sun. Using the direction of the light as a compass to forage for food. This openness is important from the point of their communication. And they always build a nest in open areas such as a rock or a building or a, or a tree branch where they can see the sun or the blue skies direct. Bees are a superorganism where good communication is key. Each bee carries out all his duties to aid the survival of the whole community. Food gathering is just one of their major daily tasks. Bees most often forage in the morning and again midday. Their bodies are covered in hairs which trap the pollen grains Nectar is sucked into their stomachs using their tongue and the pumping action of their throat. They arrive back at their nest at great speed. From the moment a bee returns, there is much to do. They touch their antenna together in a behavior known as antenating. The nectar collected earlier is regurgitated and fed to other bees. Then it's converted into honey and deposited into one of the thousands of cells in the honey chamber. Other bees look for parasites on their neighbors, helping to keep the colony healthy. Each bee performs its task for the greater good of all. For hundreds of years, smoke has been used as a means to control honeybees. Dr. Puncheheva is smoking these bees so that he can uncover the honeycomb and take a closer look at the colony. Bees get disorientated with smoke. Fearing an impending fire, they gorge on the honey. The young combs at the bottom of the nest are soft and light in color. The darker, stronger, older combs are found higher up the nest and are used to store larvae. By observing the nest, Dr. Puncheheva can monitor the health of the colony. The more honey stores in pupa, the healthier it is. The workers produce this beautiful piece of nest architecture. Wax from their glands sculpt these perfectly symmetrical cells. The combs contain honey at the very top. Stored pollen is located further down. 
The queen, always hidden from view, walks up and down at the very heart of the nest, carrying out her sole responsibility, the laying of eggs for future generations. The waxy nest acting like a giant incubator for her brood. I remember them, the Vedas, the Aborigines of Sri Lanka. They lived in Kashyapa's time and are still around today. They were honey hunters for the kings. And though the world has changed, these Vedas have not. I used to watch them, finding honey in the hollows of trees. Men of the community join together to hunt and divide the spoil equally. Honey is eaten fresh in large quantities, wax and all. The young bees inside the nest are especially wholesome. Since honey was the food of kings, the Vedas worked hard to keep Kashyapa well fed. The king lived in luxury for nearly 20 years. He loved water and built fountains and pleasure pools all over the grounds. Not far from me is a man-made lake. During the rainy season, the lake would fill and may have flowed down to the water gardens. All connected, some experts believe, by an ingenious network of underground pipes. It's one of the oldest surviving gardens in the world. Built before the Mughal Gardens in India and 500 years before the grand temples of Angkor in Cambodia. I used to see the king watching his concubines frolicking in the pools. Incredibly, the fun during the rainy months between November and January. Sigiriya was not only a playground for the king, but his ancient engineers. I stand tall and upright amidst jungle. The king, he built a thousand steps to scale me. Not an easy climb, even today. Halfway up the rock, he built a mirror wall. On one wall was painted topless nymphs, whilst the other was polished over and over again until the surface reflected them. So as he walked between these walls, women surrounded him. According to legend, these dances date back to the 5th century BC. It was a ritual created to rid the king of a magic spell. But dancing is not just confined to humans. Bees dance too. Bees have two main ways of communicating with each other. One is physical and the other is chemical. The physical communication appears as a series of dances. It's a way of informing nestmates about the location of new food. These highly aggressive insects are like well-trained pets in his expert hands. By feeding them on sweetened rose water, Dr. Punchiheva can observe them up close. Because of this communication system, when one bee finds a new source of food, it can mobilize hundreds of other workers from the colony in minutes. 
the, the, the landing bee with the new food source, new, with the new food from the new source, will just run on the comb and butting into the nest mates and saying, hey, I found some food and they all get excited. And then she offers the food to another bee, at which point several of her nest mates closely watch her. The bee's repertoire involves three dancers. Dr. Punchi Heva finds that the distance from the food source determines the dance. The round dance signifies the food is within three meters of the nest. The sickle dance, the food is up to five meters away. And the tail wagging dance, the food is over five meters away. With distance conveyed, the bees now need to communicate direction. Here, they align their bodies at the same angle as the food. Now the rest of the colony knows both the direction and distance, the feasting can begin. But even Dr. Punchiheva, with his decades of experience, can be caught unaware when it comes to these aggressive bees. As he approaches this 30-meter tree, a hungry lizard has a similar idea. The guard bees that hang at the edge of the nest are agitated, and so lizards are warned with a hiss not to come closer. The whole colony takes part in the hissing, making the sound using a rhythmic body movement which travels like a wave through the colony. If the lizard proceeds in this venture, not only he, but also Dr. Punchiheva standing at the base of the tree will face the wrath of the honeybee. These waves ripple across the colony, raising the alarm. Fortunately for both the lizard and the entomologist, the danger passes without incident. They won't normally attack. You can go very close to a nest, they won't normally attack. The bees never land on you. There's no reason. Unless there's some food or some sugary thing around which they come to feed on. But the moment you crush a bee, there's a chemical signal, which we call a pheromone, sent to the nest. But if you crush more bees, obviously there's more generation of the alarm and they would come. Days later, whilst observing a nest, Dr. Punjiheva inadvertently crushed several bees. In a matter of seconds, the crushed bees activate the alarm pheromone. More crushed bees, more alarm pheromone. It takes just one bee to send an alarm back to the nest, causing an immediate and violent reaction in the colony. Nest mates now rush to the source of the pheromone. They believe their colony is under attack. Of the three species of honeybees in South Asia, the Apis dorsata is by far the most aggressive and deadly. Three quarters of the worker population of bees is engaged in defense. Bees give up their own lives for the survival of their queen, sometimes sacrificing thousands of worker bees to save one queen. When under attack, they thin out this bee blanket. From eight bees thick down to just one bee thick, they cling together to form a defensive curtain making the nest much thinner and much larger. If you just go by the, 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 the size of the nest, it really expands. It's not due to the size of the comb, it's simply the bees are stretching themselves as a, as a curtain. Even a slightest wind can um, provoke them to attack more and more. The nest can expand to 20 to 30 centimeters from the comb, 
allowing the bees to instantly respond to the threat. Dr. Punchiheva was bitten over a dozen times through his protective armor. A terrifying exhibition of defense at its most aggressive. The victims in Siguria were less fortunate. With no protective suits, they were totally unprepared to face these ferocious warriors. King Kashyapa, my pleasure-seeking monarch, built this palace 1,500 years ago on this lion rock. And though he had many vices, he was a spiritual man. From where I stand, I see where his monastery once stood. The ancient temple is gone, but a Buddha still lies there, in peace and tranquility. Though 1500 years have passed since King Kashyapa lived at Siguria, Buddhism has remained a strong force in the country. Visits to the temple and the offering of food to the priests are still very much part of everyday life. Buddhist monks are invited to a home on special occasions. The monks come in a procession in order of seniority. A relic casket is borne on the head of a layman. Prayers called Pirith are chanted, warding off all forms of evil and danger or so people believe. One of the main pillars of Buddhism is reincarnation, the belief that life is a circle. There is no beginning and no end, just a passing souls through successive physical bodies. So the human mind travels and ends at this unconscious state and after that state is his rebirth. And if a person is attached to a place through his soul, then he could be reborn in the same place. But we can't be sure that he will be reborn in the same image. The image changes. It can be human, it can be some other animal or even a spirit. So in Sri Lanka, with its strong belief in reincarnation, when the bees go on the rampage, Locals believe they are King Kashyapa's soldiers, reborn as warrior bees, still protecting his palace even today. From ancient times, there is a belief that the bees in Siguria are the reincarnated soldiers of King Kashyapa, born to protect the rock. We believe that they do a service by attacking people sometimes, who behave inappropriately or when people cause harm to the treasures at Siguria. It's been 30 years since I came to Siguria. In these 30 years, except for two years, there has been a bee attack every year. The people who live here believe that these bees are the reincarnation of King Kashapa's soldiers. They think that the bees are protectors of Siguria. King Kashyapa was always fearful of his brother, out for revenge for the murder of their father. So the king built high walls and moats and guard posts on my grounds, believing they would keep him safe. And they did, for a while. Broad moats lined with granite blocks stretched out over two miles. They even teemed with crocodiles. Stone walls enclosed my city. Boulders became guard posts. These ancient brick walls exist today. Of others, just the grooves remain. The king built his palace at the top of the rock, 200 meters above the city so his enemies would have to climb a thousand steps before they could reach him. 
Guarding the entrance to his palace was this magnificent lion. That's how I got my name. Time has eroded this huge creature. Now, only its paws remain. The king was a secretive man and feared for his life. He took only his queens with him beyond the Lion Rock, building his palace at my highest peak. The Lion Staircase spirals its way to the summit and the king's pleasure palace. It was like being on top of the world. Stretching over three acres and in a palace to the west. Palace gardens to the south. All meeting at a large rock pool. Once there were dancing terraces, a rainwater pool, a flower garden and platforms for guards. Now, almost everything is gone. King Kashapa made this fortress for keeping people out. 1500 years on, visitors are encouraged to come in. Hundreds of thousands of people a year. When the bees of Sigiriya go on the rampage, authorities step in to safeguard the tourists and close the site to let the bees calm down. After the attack in May 2004, Sigiriya was closed for four days. The sacred full moon day, or Poya, is a monthly national holiday in Sri Lanka. A day of reverence for the faithful. On full moon days, humans come in their thousands. They crawl all over me, in my gardens and at my peak. Disturbing me, breaking the calm and the quiet. As the crowds get louder, my army grows restless. It is no easy task to walk up the thousand steps to reach the summit of this magnificent rock. If you can battle the heat, which can reach over 30 degrees Celsius in June and contend with the gusty winds. There is one main path up the summit and one main path down. The last thing on the mind of most visitors are the army of bees who lie in wait at the Lion Rock. On days with large numbers of people, the bees grow increasingly agitated by the noise and vibrations of the crowd. My army is large. Up to a hundred thousand soldiers in every nest, and over a dozen nests on my rock ledge. Sigiriya is home to a million warriors, defending their home until the bitter end. Kalu has been a Sigiriya helper for 20 years, supporting tourists as they struggle with a steep climb up and down the steps. Usually, tourists start arriving by about 7 in the morning, and I approach them to see if they need any assistance climbing the rock. There had been a bee attack the previous day, and the guides had warned us about it, but I had secured some work to help this one tourist. There is this one point on the Sigiriya climb where you have to climb past the nests of the bees. They started attacking just as we were passing this point. So we had to turn back and run down. At this point, both of us were being attacked heavily. The German tourist that I was helping was very scared and he was screaming. Despite the fact that I too was being attacked, 
my instinct was to think of the safety of the tourist in my care. So I held him by his hand and guided him to safety. By this time we'd been stung endlessly. They had even gone into our ears. The giant stinging honeybees, once on the attack, are merciless and will keep attacking the crowds in waves until the danger has passed, always attacking downwards for several hundred meters. Kalu was bitten over 200 times. With this amount of venom in his body, it might have been fatal. He, along with 14 other patients, two of them German, were admitted to hospital. They were all stung hundreds of times. Unconscious, Kalu was in a critical condition. A bee sting can be serious. Most people have only a mild allergic reaction to the venom. However, for some, a severe reaction called anaphylactic shock may occur. The throat may swell, blocking the airway, and the heart may stop. A worker bee has a sting at the end of her abdomen. The sting sticks in the victim's skin so firmly, the bee rips her internal organs to get away. The venom continues to enter the victim from the stinger for 45 to 60 seconds. In the United States alone, more people die from insect stings than from spider or snake bites. The Vatdas, the traditional honey gatherers of Sri Lanka, have collected honey for thousands of years, but they have a couple of tricks up their sleeve. The very aggressive giant bee, they only pillage on moonless nights. Without light, the colony is disorientated and cannot attack. They also use a preparation of ochre leaves to diffuse the stings of the less aggressive honey bees. The ochre leaves are ground together with salty water and applied to neutralize the stings. There have been no fatalities from bee attacks in Sigiriya, though the attacks keep recurring. In response, the government has tried eliminating the bees. After realizing the threat that the bees posed, officers from the Cultural Triangle and Sigiriya decided to destroy the bees. They tried using a poisonous gas to kill the bees, but in less than a year they were back, exactly where they were. They even tried covering the nests with nylon nets. Even that didn't help. But in this Buddhist country, Many believe the bees serve a divine purpose and should be left alone. For it's only when people throw stones at the nest or make excessive noise the bees go on a rampage. People tend to disrespect this great place that our ancestors left us. King Kashapa put his life into this and left us this incredible place. We must protect these things throughout history. So if people don't understand this and disrespect this, then these attacks will occur. My soldiers do not attack unless provoked. It is their duty to defend the king's palace. King Kashipa lived in splendor and had many luxuries. But there was one thing he could never have, something priceless, his peace of mind. He lived in fear for his life, that he would be killed by his brother. And that day was coming. Life is followed by death, is followed by life, in an endless cycle. Such is our belief in reincarnation. The king's soldiers died long ago, but an army still lives here, with me, always defending 
their lion rock. After the worst bee attack in Sigiriya in May of 2004, where 200 people were viciously stung by thousands of angry bees, Sigiriya remained closed. Monks were brought to Sigiriya to soothe the situation, not for the victims, but to calm the bees. Buddhist prayers were chanted to bring blessings to the rock and to the souls of these angry warriors. Whether depleted in numbers due to an attack or running out of food sources, the nest goes into decline. A common scavenger of the bee is the wax moth, seen here in the white lighter patches on the comb. If the colony had been healthy, the wax moth would have been killed on entry. But colonies that are hungry will allow a predator to trespass with no hindrance. Female wax moths can deposit masses of eggs on unprotected honeycombs. After a few days, these larvae hatch and begin their feeding frenzy, destroying the comb. Worker bees only live for 50 days, whilst the queen lives for years. But nothing in life is wasted, so these ants feast on the multitude of dead bees. Some bees die of natural causes, others are part of an attacking army and die once they have stung their victims. And the cycle of life and death and rebirth continues. The monsoon rains fall in October and the warrior bees leave Sigiriya. Each colony has its own smell, keeping track of each other by scent. This is a once-in-a-lifetime journey. Only the queen lives long enough to make more than one migration. The colony may lose up to 50% of its bees before reaching the new nesting grounds, which could be up to 160 kilometers away. But incredibly, future generations are able to find their way back to Sigiriya. King Kashipa lived in luxury for 18 years, surrounded by his wives, his soldiers, and his concubines but nothing lasts forever. His brother found him at last, seeking revenge for the murder of their father. Kashyapa heard of his arrival and rode out to meet him in battle, but fate was against him. Kashyapa and his elephant hit marshy ground and turned back. His army thought he was retreating and retreated themselves. Alone suddenly and facing death at the hands of his brother, he did the honorable thing. He slit his own throat. Buddhist monks lived here long before Kashyapa arrived, and so too long after his death. The new king gave me back to the monks, and so peace returned. But. As the circle of life continues, the monk's time with me also passed. And then the mighty jungle grew over me. For over 500 years, I was completely alone. But as monks and kings and tourists come and go, the bees remain. Returning year after year in their hundreds of thousands to the exact same spot on their lime rock. <laughs>